Hello, this is Vale and welcome back to my channel and in this video today I'm going to be talking about the more behind the scenes of what happens when we perform an attack on WPA2 personnel. So the reason I'm here doing this video today is I have many friends in this field of cybersecurity who are uh, currently new to this field and they are more oblivious about the facts of how uh, things work in the background but they are more concerned about how to actually perform an attack to get something back or to hack something and report it to them so that's why I am making this video today so uh, one of my friends I called him and asked how the attack works so the conception he said was so there is the access point and there is the client and the client uh, communicates with the access point by sending an encrypted version of the password or the pre-shared key what we know as and what AeroDump does is it takes the encrypted password and it runs a brute force attack on the password and that's how we get the key back but actually that is not what happens and this is a disclaimer that I'm not going to be showing you how to hack a Wi-Fi password because there are millions of videos on YouTube, Udemy, Alinda and there is basically four to five commands to hack a Wi-Fi which I'm going to say now so basically what happens is <clears throat> you buy a card, you buy a Wi-Fi card which has the packet injection capability and you put it in monitor mode then you use Aerodump NG like what I'm using now you use Aerodump NG to sniff out all the access points so you can see Veil, Deceiver, Netgear, these are all my access points so what it does is uh, we if if I target Veil for example if I target this access point so what we do is we do a targeted sniffing with error dump and after we have captured a successful handshake we can run error crack ng with a huge word list which might or might not get us the password back so how all of these things work I'm not exactly going to show you how to actually perform the attack but I am more going to be talking about what happens in the background. So basically, what my friend said about the encrypted password is not completely wrong, like he has some common misunderstanding. So actually the password is not encrypted. And the passwords in WPA2, which makes it very secure, at least for the old days, was that there was no passwords that are actually transferred over into the air maybe it's encrypted or not no password is ever transferred between two devices one of them which is at the access point and one of them which is the supplicant so there is no transfer of passwords like in WEP which was very vulnerable back in the days so there are a uh, lot of IVs or initial initialization vectors which are sent over to the air so what happens is Aerodump captures all of these IVs and Air Crack NG runs a statistical attack on the IVs and thus it finds out the key but in case of WPA2 there is no passwords or IVs that are sent over to the air so it's useless for just sniffing the data for a day long and to perform an, an attack so the passwords are not encrypted but there is some kind of hashing going on in between which I'm going to talk about now so if you are familiar with my previous videos then you should probably know what hashing is but still for this video for who are new to this video I'm going to be talking about what hashing is one more time so a hash function is a function that can be used to map data of an arbitrary size onto a fixed size data for example, SHA-256 will take any arbitrary length data and spit out uh, 256 bits or 32 bytes length of string which is mathematically completely irreversible and that is one of the main differences between cryptography and hashing because hashing is completely irreversible so whatever is hashed into a fixed length size cannot be reversed back to the plain text from which it was hashed but in encryption anything that can be encrypted from one piece of plain text can be decrypted back so that is one of the biggest differences between the cryptography part and the hashing part so where are these hash functions used so hashing can be used as a verification for digital signatures so what happens is 
if I sent someone a file which has a letter for example and I do not want anyone to read the letter or to alter the letter so what happens if I send someone a message and there is a hacker in the middle he can read the message okay but he cannot alter the message alright so that is what I want but that is not exactly true with raw hashing because if you send a hash of the data and the data both to your friend for example and your friend recreates the hash on the data and if the both hashes match then he can know that yes the data in the middle is not altered by a hacker or lost in transit so one problem is if the hacker takes the message he alters the message and recomputes the hash so what happens when the actual recipient gets the message and he hashes the message back to some data and if both of the data matches because it will the hacker also recomputed the hash when he had the data in possession so when the actual recipient sees the message and hashes it back and the both hashes will match and he or she will think that okay the data is unaltered but in reality they, they are actually altered so we cannot actually use directly the hashing algorithm when we are sending out data or when we are using it as a digital signature but it was used back in the days and one very important functionality of hashing is what many of us think is that when we are encrypting something a big chunk of data maybe or a plain text we are using a password or a passphrase directly as a key for performing encryption and decryption on the chunk of data but it's a very bad practice it was used maybe 10 to 15 years ago but it's a very bad practice as maybe if the word is hello or query if the password is qwerty and that is directly used as a key for encryption and decryption anyone can brute force a million words and if the qwerty if the word qwerty is within the word list then easily the file will be decrypted that's why that is not used anymore that is a very bad practice that is using the password directly as a key so what we can do is we can hash the password so as I have said that it can be used to map data of arbitrary size which says that it can be a one character password or it can be a million character password so that's not the thing here but still what I'm trying to say here is that you can use a hash function over the password and it will generate a 32 bytes long in only in case of SHA-256 as well so maybe just assume that we are using SHA-256 as the password uh, as the hashing function for the password so the quality will be spit out, spit it out to a uh, SHA-256 version and we can use that key we can use that hash message as a key the problem is that the pass the hacker cannot directly use the passwords anymore to hack the encrypted data what he has to do is to he has to take all the words in a word list and convert them to SHA-256 first then he can perform a brute force so 10 to 15 years ago that was not the problem which we had but now it's very much of a problem because as we come onto the generations as the generations are increasing the computing power is increasing as much now we have quantum computing so with that it's going to be a piece of cake but what was used back then was a SHA-256 version maybe of a password is being generated and that is used as a key for the encryption and decryption process so now we have a problem that anyone with a little bit of computing resources can generate a million hashed passwords which he can use as a key as a trial key for the decryption of a data of an encrypted data so what we can use and what is used today is something called an HMAC so forget this assault for now just I'm not going to be going in very much details but still what happens when we use an HMAC is we take the message for example the message is the big chunk of data that we are sending to a friend so we take the message and we hash the message but not just has the message we also hash the key as well so what happens there is a key in here which is appended to the message and this whole part is hashed with maybe shadow physics 
not a problem. Then what we do is we append the same key with this part of the hash and we then hash it again which makes it a hashed keyed message authentication code. So this is kind of very secure and this is the standard which is still used nowadays and it's kind of a very lengthy breaking process it goes through for example if any hacker wants to uh, do a million passwords then he has to work a lot a lot of computer resources would be used to actually perform the attack so many of us doesn't have that much of computing power in our hands so we can perform this message uh, perform this attack so <coughs> one thing I, I did not do I did not write here the formula because I do not want this video to be complicated for newcomers so that's why I am just going on a very high level abstract overview level of the whole thing. So again, what an HMAC is, the message is appended with the key first and then it is hashed. After that, again the same key is used to append with the hashed version of the message and the key and then again the whole thing is hashed again. So that is a kind of a very secure way of having a digital signature. Now shouldn't we use hash at all yes we should for example when you are performing a digital forensics or you are performing um, a backup of your faulty hard drive so what you can do you do not know exactly where the bad sectors are so what you can do you can go over to the hard drive the old hard drive and hash all of the data in your hard drive and spit out maybe a 32 byte value so you keep that value, you uh, copy and paste that value to somewhere in, a, in your phone maybe and then after the data has been copied to the newer hard drive, you again perform a hash of all the data in the newer hard drive. So then you hash again, yes exactly and if the both hashes from the old drive and the, from the new drive matches then you know that no data has been altered but if those hashed values do not exactly match then you have an alteration in the message so maybe there was some bad sectors within your old hard drive and some data wasn't copied correctly so in that case you can use a usual hash but when we are using that hash a same hash for example for using it as an encryption key or to send someone as a digital signature just using a plain old hash is not sufficient enough so another thing which I didn't tell yet is that these are exactly not the same keys. That is the key in here and the key in here are exactly not the same. The inputs are same, yes, but there are some pad functions which I'm not going to get into. But this part is called O pad or outer pad and this part is called inner pad. And these are XORed with the key which makes the this key different and the inner key different so basically the key the same key the same pre-shared key is used to derive two more keys which are then used to perform this HMAC operation which makes it kind of secure so I'm going to be doing a very small example so what if I say that the password is hello I'm going to show you what happens. So SHA256 dot new. You should probably know this because these all of the things are already in my previous video, but not the hashing part especially. So I'm going to pa pass in the password and then encode it into bytes. And then I'm going to say hex digest. I want the value in hex. So this is the value, right? So what happens if we take this value and paste it here. So this is a crack station, a kind of um, word list. It has a 1.5 TB uh, word list. Yes, no, um, I'm not I'm not exactly sure. Oh, yes, it's 190 GB. It's basically 15 billion entry and these are all pre-computed hashes. Uh, pre-computed hashes means all of these passwords every possible words in the dictionary are hashed first so this is also called a rainbow table so every password if you convert it first to a hash that is exactly not a rainbow table it's it's more uh, hard so you have to convert every 
uh, words to a hash value and then compare the hash value to the resulting hash value which you want to crack for example but when you do not have to exactly convert all of the words in your word list and because you already have a hashed version of all those passwords it's called a rainbow table and what crack station does is this crack station website has a pre-computed list of million passwords so you do not have to hash anything at all so if this is the hash that I have copied from Python here and if I just say crack hashes okay this is boring if I just say crack hashes you can see that the type of my hash is SHA256 and the result is hello so thus we can see that already this is in the database so any hacker if this is used as a encryption key for example any hacker can actually use this to derive that the original password was hello and now he has his decrypted hacked data in his possession so if I do the same in an HMAC let's see what happens so what I can do is we can also add a salt so just let me see what happens if I add a salt so salt is something that is appended or prepended with the actual message to make it a little bit of more entropy so if I just say that the password is one two three four five just for example this is very bad no random number is generated like this but still I'm just showing this for the sake of simplicity and then we write hello so what happens is now this is acting as a salt and this is the original password now if I do the same and perform the same exact hashing mechanisms so, so you can see that the password are basically hello in this case I I have added one two three four five but it's between you and me that we know this part but the real password is hello if we are a programmer we are going to take the password from the user and the user is going to be giving just hello he is not going to be giving this salt value this would be randomly generated but again if I take this value which is completely different from the above and paste this here again I have to prove that I'm not a robot and you can see yet still the password is already on the database for crack station so I'm now going to say uh, to show you a basic key derivation mechanism so we can use this HMAC way all over but I'm going to directly show you a better way which is key derivation function so if I use the same exact 12345 as a salt and the hello as a message let's see what happens so maybe just write again password is hello and the salt is one two three four five exact same thing now what I'm going to do is we are going to derive a key the password the key is going to be hello sorry password the salt is going to be salt the number of length the number of characters we want in our resulting hash is maybe 32 and then the number of iterations for example I'm just giving it an iteration number of 1 which is very bad practice nowadays using more than 10,000 is actually quite sufficient but again just for the sake of simplicity I'm going to be using only one and the HMAC function which is using which PBDF which is which PBKDF2 is using here is SHA1 all right so the same thing is happening in within the PBDF PBKDF2 it's basically a password based key derivation function version 2 it's it's like a tongue twister it, it does not work very easy on the mouth so again this function is going to be happening within this key derivation mechanism and we are going to be giving it the password the salt the number of characters we want and the number of iterations so the more you iterate it's going to be better for you it's going to be slow for the hacker to recreate everything and the main good thing about password based key derivation function is that these hashes are not very much available in a pre-computed way manner because nobody knows how much iterations I'm going to give so nobody is going to be 
making word list for each iterations for one iterations for two iterations up to two million iterations nobody is going to give that so we have to compute it all by ourselves in our home computer so it's going to be very hard to regenerate everything so that's when clusterization we can use Amazon or you know we can use a labs clustered computers maybe 50 or 60 computers at once and share the load between them but again that is big talk we are not going to talk about that now so we are using the same mechanism right we are using hello and the salt has one two three four five so what happens is the hello is going to be the key and the message which I am saying here the message is going to be the salt right so if I press enter okay so we needed to do this in hex actually so if I just do hex and we get this this is also different from this one so the basic thing is same we are using hello and we are using 1 2 3 4 5 as a salt like we did here but let's see if this is in the database see nothing there is not even a partial match so the type is unknown and not found so you can see that using a key derivation function is actually very secure and I'm just showing you with this one iteration but it's also very much easy to regenerate but it's not going to be on the public list of hashed rainbow tables so that's why it's a little bit secure so now the reason I have showed you password based key derivation function 2 is because WPA2 actually uses one so let's go to that part now so if I go to WPA2 what happens is this so the salt which is used in the pbdfk2 hmac function within wpa2 is actually the ssid or the service set identifier right so for example if you uh, go to my Kali linux box and if you see the deceiver for the first ap is the ssid right so what happens deceiver is going to be given as the salt all right as the message and the salt is used as a message in pbdfk2 in case of wpa2 so what happens is the SSID is deceiver and that is appended with the pre-shared key which is XORed with iPad or the inner pad right so it makes the key a little bit different than what it should be so that is appended and hashed you can see these both things are hashed I have forgot to give a closing bracket here but you can understand that right so then the same PSK which is going to be the password hello for this example is going to be exhort with outer pad which makes the password a little bit different and the whole thing is again going to be hashed and all of these hashing functions are done by SHA1 in case of WPA2 so SHA1 is used as the hashed message authentication code within WPA2 password based key derivation system so if you are lost you can always go back and play this part again and again so that's how you understand and there is always your best friend Google so anyways now let's directly jump into how exactly the four-way handshake which we know as what we have to capture with AeroDump ng and then we have to crack it right so what exactly goes in the air what do we actually capture so when we are turning on our Wi-Fi and there is our own access point nearby first there is a basic authentication and association process that goes in that is completely unencrypted by the way and it's just getting yourself your device associated with the access point after that the four-way handshake actually begins so what happens the access point sends the supplicant an a nonce value so if you don't know what an A nonce is, it's basically if you just cancel out the A, let's say it's nonce. So a nonce is kind of a number used only once. All right. So an A in this case represents the access point. So A nonce. All right. Access point nonce or authenticator nonce. What is it actually called? So access point generates a random value and sends it to the supplicant. All right, all good. 
on the second message the supplicant sends its own nonce value along with a mic or message integrity code so the message integrity code is a hashed value of something but before what before it comes to that part where I say what is that something let me say what happens with the PBDFK2 function within WPA2 so what happens when the access point actually sends the supplicant the A nonce it keeps it within its memory but in between what happens something called a pairwise master key is generated in both the devices which is the supplicant and the access point right so what is the pairwise master key pairwise master key is basically this operation so what happens is we provide in the salt which is in this case the SSID which is used as the message within the HMAC well uh, within the HMAC function within the PBDFK2 and the key is the actual password the password that we give on the router or on the device so that password is used as the key within the HMAC value within the password based key revision function and this whole process is iterated over 4096 times and that generates a hashed value which we are going to use and another thing which I have said the DK length value or the derived key length value which is in the previous example where I used the crack station website was 32 right I gave in Python the number 32 but what happens in case of WPA2 is the derived key length is of 256 bytes right so what happens here the PNK is thus generated or the pairwise master key is generated so what happens when the supplicants the supplicant gets the anons value it already has the pairwise master key and it generates its own value which is the s nonce right which you see in this slide so now the supplicant generates something called a pairwise transient key so how a pairwise transient key is generated so the pairwise transient key is an HMAC function it's not a password based key derivation function anymore it's just an HMAC function used only once so what it actually does is it hashes it performs the HMAC operation on five things the pairwise master key appended with the a nonce value which the access point send over appended with the s nonce value which the supplicant made itself after that it uses the access points MAC address and the supplicants own MAC address all of these things are appended and an HMAC operation is performed alright now this pairwise transient key is now generated which is also basically a hashed value but this transient key is never sent over to the access point what it does it is it sends the s nonce value which the supplicant generated and the message integrity code so what is the message integrity code the message integrity code is an HMAC MD5 value of the pairwise transient key alright so that MIC value is transferred over to the access point along with the s nonce so now does the access point have the pairwise transient key no does the access point has the pairwise master key yes so how can the access point generates its own pairwise transient key so in the second step of the message what happens the access point has its own MAC address yes the access point has its own um, a nonce value yes the access point has its own pairwise master key yes the access point has its own s nonce value no but in the second message it does get the s nonce value right so now the access point has everything so it again performs an HMAC operation on the s nonce a nonce client MAC access point MAC and the pairwise master key and comes up with a pairwise transient key now how can the access point know that the supplicant and the access point itself has the same pairwise transient keys it can't right but that's why on the second message the supplicant also sent an, a message integrity code right 
Now what happens? The access point has its own pairwise transient key and that key is hashed with an MD5 HMAC generating its own message integrity code. So now the supplicant already sends its message integrity code. The access point also made also generated its own message integrity code. Now these if these message integrity codes match then the access point knows that the supplicant and the access point has the exact same pairwise transient keys hence the same pairwise master keys hence the same passwords at this point the access point sends another message to the supplicant saying that we have the exact same message integrity codes which means we have the same pairwise master keys and pairwise transient keys now you can go and install the keys these keys are going to be in encrypting or decrypting the data when they actually start transferring data and actually start working so another thing which I do not which I did not say here is the access point also uh, generates a group wise transient key and that is used for multicast or broadcast networks but in this case I'm only saying about an unicast way so the access point sends the supplicant a message saying that you now may install the keys which will be later used for encryption and decryption processes and now lastly the supplicant says okay what you have told me I have done so now we have everything we can now start transferring regular user data so what happens when we actually hack it what goes on with in the air so in Aerodum, we captured this whole four-way handshake. So now what we have as a hacker, we have the enons value which comes in from the access point to the supplicant unencrypted. We have the snons value and the message integrity code which comes from the supplicant to the access point. And that's all we need for the hack to work. The first two messages basically. So what happens? We take our own word list and we perform a pbkdf2 function with exactly 4096 times and using the SSID as the salt. Now what happens the main breaking point for WPA2 is that the SSID is used as a salt. So we do not have to figure out a salt or we do not have to brute force a salt or there is nothing about the salt that we don't know right. The SSID is the salt. So we can just make a pbdfk2 hash using the salt as the SSID and the message as there are in the word list so every maybe there is a million words in the word list we are going to perform a pbkdf2 function for all of the million words using the ssid as the salt right iterating over 4096 times with a 256 byte uh, derived key length so after all the hashes has been generated now what do we have we have the pairwise master keys right because we have just generated them with the pbkdf2 so what we have now we have the pbkdf2 version of the uh, we have the basically the pairwise master keys we have the a nonce we have the s nonce so and also clear text we got the mac address of the access point and the mac address of the supplicant so we have everything to generate a pairwise transient key now we start generating the pairwise transient key by performing a uh, SHA-1 MAC, uh, HMAC hashing algorithm, right? So we perform all of the pairwise transient keys and we also have the MIC from the second message, right? So now we hash that pairwise transient keys and hash them with uh, HMAC MD5 and if the MAC that is generated with the brute force attack and the MIC generated from the handshake matches that's how we know that what are the what is the actual password is so for every password again if I say for every password in the word list a PMK will be generated from the PMK and the anons values and the snons values and from both the MAC addresses a pairwise transient key will be generated and from those pairwise transient key a message integrity code will be generated right so if the generated MIC codes match with the captured MIC, we can know what the password actually was.
So if I just go on to my Kali VM and open up Wireshark, I have a capture already recorded here. So if I just make it the full screen. So we want only EAP OL messages, right? So these are, by the way, these all, the four-way the four handshake comes under the e -A -E APOL or Extensible Authentication Protocol uh, messages. So EAPOL, if I just type here, and you can see the four-way handshake, and it's clear as water. We have one out of four, two out of four, three out of four, and fourth message. So if I just double-click here, we can see that we have the anons value. So if we can see the anons value, also can error dump, right? This is the version of an error dump, by the way. So we have the anons value. On the second key, on the second uh, message, we have the we have the anons value, and we have the MIC value, right? So now we can, and also we have the MAC addresses. That is very normal. So we have the MAC addresses. We have the MIC. We have the anons. And on the first message, we got the anons value. And if I just click on three out of four, we can say, if we can find it out, we can see that install is set now, right? So it's turned one. So as we have all of the information that we need for aircrack to work, we can actually start aircrack, and aircrack will do all of the work from converting each word to a PMK then to PTK and then to mic and to check that if the both MICs are equal. So that's how the WPA2 attack works behind the scenes and I think I have explained it pretty well and I am very open to comments if I was wrong at some points so I'm very open so if anyone of you are kind enough to correct me if I'm wrong. So thank you for now. Let's see again on the next video. Goodbye.